Hello, I'm Donna Hanover, and welcome to Arts in the City from the Cloisters, one of the jewels of New York City. The Cloisters Museum and Gardens, part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art devoted to the art and architecture of medieval Europe, was assembled from international structural elements dating largely from the 12th to the 15th centuries. Located in Fort Tryon Park in Upper Manhattan, the Cloisters collection comprises approximately 2,000 works of art. The first ever presentation of contemporary art here is a sound sculpture. The 40-part motet is based on a piece composed in the 1500s, presented with a new spin. The 40-part motet is a sound installation by Canadian artist Janet Cardiff. It's a reworking of the celebrated 16th century uh, motet sacred motet Speminalium, written by the renowned composer, Tudor composer, Thomas Tallis. The title in English is, In No Other Is My Hope. Anne Strauss, associate curator in the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, explains that this sound sculpture plays on 40 speakers because when the artist recorded England's Salisbury Cathedral Choir in the year 2000, she set a microphone for each part, so there are 40 individual tracks of music. The idea is that each listener experiences the piece differently depending on where you stand or move among the speakers. So you get the, the speakers, they go bass, baritone, alto, tenor, child soprano. You can stand next to speakers and hear individual singers performing. Typically when you're experiencing this piece, you are in an audience mm -hmm. and there is a distance between you and the performers. Here, you're in the midst of it. It's immersive and Janet Cardiff has said that with this piece she feels that you can get as close as you possibly can to being inside a work of art. The Cloisters itself is an annex of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. C. Griffith Mann, the curator in charge of medieval art and the cloisters at the Met, says a cloister in a monastery was a gathering place for monks or nuns, usually an open garden surrounded by colonnades and walkways. Cloisters that were originally in European churches and monasteries and were reassembled here at the north end of the island of Manhattan. And the whole concept was to give people a sense of being transported in time and place back to the Middle Ages. The Cloisters is actually an unusual setting for the 40-part motet. Janet envisioned the piece originally in a neutral setting, in a white cube space, shall we say. The Museum of Modern Art owns an edition of this piece. They display it in a white cube setting. Here we have an extraordinary opportunity to present it in the exquisite setting of the Fuente Duena Chapel. It's architecturally evocative with its 12th century apse that uh, is on permanent loan from the Spanish government that comes from the Church of San Martin in Fuente Duena uh, near Segovia. It has superb acoustics. Many of the spaces that medieval monasteries had were created to bring together monks or nuns that would have gathered together throughout the day to sing the divine office. The 40-part motet is really taking advantage of the sound and acoustical nature of the space itself. And you can hear how resonant the space is. Do you hear that reverb? Um, what they did is he, the workmen actually labeled each block so that they would know how to put it back together when it was reassembled here in New York. The 40-part motet is played on a continuous loop, but before the 11 minutes of music start, there are three minutes that are a delightful surprise. That is where the uh, singers who are about to perform are preparing to sing. I They're listen making... to it. It's funny. Yes, it is funny. They're clearing their throats. Some are humming some bars. Some talk about making mistakes every time they sing that part of it. One says, let's rock right before um, before they get going and you hear the conductor saying we're going to run through this and unless there's a calamity they'll just they'll just keep going then uh, out comes this glorious music
I view it as something very special, not only for the Cloisters, but for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I think this uh, interest that we have in pairing works that are made in our time with works from the past and the setting of these spaces that evoke a time gone by is a very exciting moment. It's also the first time that sound art is being given an exhibition at the Met. This is a sound installation. It's a sound sculpture. So you hear all of the singers who performed this piece one by one. And then there are these great crescendos of music where they all come together in waves of sound. It's poignant, it's powerful. It's a piece that has extraordinary emotional resonance. He's a stage and film actor, a dancer, singer, Tony and Oscar winner, and a photographer with a brand new book, his fourth. He's the one and only Joel Gray. And Pat Collins caught up with him at his new book launch. This is my fourth book and my fourth show. And all of them deal with New York and what, how it changes and what's left over. Some of that, which is left over, are billboards. For years, Joel has been fascinated by them. What inspires you in addition to billboards? The things I can't put my finger on. Things that are somewhere in the middle of, of knowing and not knowing. Myst mystery. There have been many surprises in Joel's life, like the night he won a Best Actor Oscar for Cabaret. I was sure I wasn't going to win because my competition was Al Pacino. Oh, and him. Uh -huh. We were certain <laughs> that he was going to win because it was a breakthrough, brilliant performance in The Godfather. You won, he didn't. Or so let's say year. it was my turn. How does Joel decide what Broadway shows are right for him? What goes into making that decision? I'm going back to Anything Goes, which was quite recent. What goes in? Because these are exhausting. Well, high energy. We can talk about Chicago, which is high energy, The Wizard in Wicked, and we can talk about Anything Goes. And I didn't want to do any of those. I thought I was wrong for those parts. Joel is not drawn to performing now. However, he is excited about introducing us to an art form most of us have overlooked. Look at this. This, there go, this goes down all the way to the wood, which rarely happens. This is the miracle. It's the, the happening on the street. So it's not as if it's you about my eyes. back and forth ten times and finally Never. No, it's instant. Well, we want to talk about how you take. You have the iPhone 5. Yes, I have all the big cameras too. But I find that I have the iPhone 5 with me all the time. The Billboard Papers is available online and here at the Stephen Kasher Gallery. I'm Pat Collins for Arts in the City. A drummer by profession, Daniel Glass has taken on a new project that looks at American history through changes in rhythm, music, and the development of the drum set. Lisa Beth Kovitz spoke with him about the Century Project. Hi, I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz for Arts in the City. There is an infinite number of ways to look at American history. The same number applies to the history of music. Drummer Daniel Glass has created a DVD called The Century Project that traces the story of the drum set from the Civil War to the British invasion. The reason I chose this 100 year period is that 1865, the end of the Civil War, saw African Americans being able to participate in society more as, as free people and, and they play into the evolution of American music obviously very strongly to this day. Um, at the same time, uh, drummers were beginning to take the instruments of a marching drum section, meaning a bass drum, a snare drum, and a cymbal, and combine them so they could be played by one person. 
So the drum set, the story of the drum set really begins around the same time period. If you flash forward 100 years, by the time we get to 1965 and the British invasion, the blueprint of the drum set that we still use today was really solidified. In the intervening 100 years, this incredible story happens where the drum set, you know, how it evolves, where it comes from, where the pieces come from, uh, almost really is a, a great metaphor for telling the story of America. You have immigrants who bring their ethnic instruments with them. You have a combination of European-American um, you know, music forms and instruments, but with an African-American feel. And, uh, and then there's the backdrop of all these incredible events like the Depression and World War II. Did rhythm evolve with American history? The evolution of rhythm is the evolution of dance. And one of the things I really try to get drummers to realize is that their job, regardless of whatever style of music they play, is to make people dance. You know, whether it's free jazz and their head is bobbing and there isn't an exact pulse, or, you know, whether it's uh, swing dance music or dance club music or whatever it may be. And our society changed so much, hinged on those dances. With each successive generation, they want to have their own music that they can identify with, that they can dance to. That's what's driving these, these evolutionary changes. And you know, and it's always the music is something that their parents don't want them to dance to or don't want them to listen to. It it's, makes the parents unnerved so the kids go, well, this is my music then, for sure. Everyone sees an event from their own personal perspective. So in the case of the Beatles' arrival in America, we all saw it from a musical perspective, from a sociological perspective, from a hair perspective. But drummers saw Ringo from a really particular perspective. Right. Uh, well, Ringo used um, a grip called the match grip, where you essentially hold both sticks the same way as opposed to the traditional grip, which goes back to the days of marching. And prior to this time, most drummers used the traditional grip. That was sort of the default grip. Um, but when you get to the Beatles, because he used this somewhat unusual grip, a generation of drummers saw that. And almost overnight, the, the standard de facto grip that a drummer used flip-flopped from the traditional to the match grips. The Ludwig Drum Company, which was Ringo's company, became the number one company, and they had to they had to make drum sets 24 hours a day to keep up with the demand. So that's really my last event of 1865 to 1965 in the completion of the drum set and how we play it. Music history and American history, they go hand in hand forever. In a way, um, for most of the 20th century and into the 21st century, the world's popular music really has evolved from America, whether it's jazz, rhythm and blues, bebop, rock and roll, or you know, hip hop and, and, and rap today, um, a lot of it has generated right, right here in this country. And uh, the world is always paying very close attention to what we're doing musically. Daniel, thank you so much for talking to us. The history of America through music. This has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Arts in the City. Outside of its native New Orleans, no community has nurtured jazz more than Harlem. The National Museum of Jazz in Harlem is dedicated to preserving the spirit of this musical style. Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson sat down with the museum's artistic director to learn how the museum is inspiring the neighborhood. We're here at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. We'll be chatting with artistic director Lauren Schoenberg about the museum's impact in this community. The National Jazz Museum in Harlem opened a little over 12 years ago on East 126th Street. Its director, Lauren Schoenberg, who also happens to be a saxophonist and pianist, gave us a little history about this very intimate yet special place. Well, we've tried to embody in the institution uh, kind of the values of jazz itself. We decided that we wanted to integrate music uh, the performance of music uh, and also the endorphin rush that happens to people when they listen to music. We wanted to integrate that into the DNA of the institution itself. And that's kind of what we've done. The museum prides itself on being a central part of the community. And while people can easily visit the museum, 
The museum also likes to visit the neighborhood. So here you have an institution that's open 52 weeks a year. The great bulk of the programs are free. And you know that when you come here, you're going to hear some interesting music, you're going to meet some interesting people, and you're going to leave kind of thinking about things and feeling things. So I think that we offer something to the Harlem community that doesn't exist anywhere else. And when you talk about community, just so people understand also, you're not just listening, hearing, coming to hear the music here. There are bands playing in Absolutely. other locations around the neighborhood, yes. right? Over the course of the last decade plus, the Jazz Museum in Harlem has been at so many local churches, in schools, uh, at the Studio Museum in Harlem, at the Museum of the City of New York, uh, at uh, various, uh, at MIST on 116th Street. We're all over the place. We just finished a program uh, in senior houses. Wow. Uh, so this is at, almost yes. like a traveling circus, <laughs> the museum, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it moves around. And that's a good analogy, a circus. <laughs> and I mean it because, you know, uh, in a circus, there are things that make you scared. I mean, there are, you, there's a range of emotions that you experience in a circus. Seriously, from laughter to tears almost. And jazz is really the same kind of way. You know, it's not just good time music. Hmm. Jazz is the ultimate representation of the great potential of American society. And this community right here is the perfect proving ground. Like many museums, the walls are plastered with photos. In this case, jazz legends, both old and new, something Lauren Schoenberg is quite proud of. And the whole idea here is that here you have, I mean, this is like having, I mean, you know, the, the, the founders of civilization sure. all in one place. There's a great film made about it called The Great Day in Harlem. And our idea is that they are facing the new artists of today. Jazz is a quintessential American art form. Yes. Is, is having a museum here, in a place like this, in this neighborhood, your way of honoring that art form? Absolutely. You know, uh, having the Jazz Museum here in Harlem is the best way for us to honor uh, the art form itself, because it was created in communities like this. Uh, all the great innovators of the first decades of jazz were all African American, with very few exceptions. And what better place to be than in this community, out of which all that came. Arts in the city. <laughs> it's arts in the city. <laughs>
that even a shape that seems sort of complicated like a heart can have a, a simple formula that, that, that determines it. Co-executive director Cindy Lawrence says helping people see past two dimensions into three dimensions is what's behind the laser display called Wall of Fire. So we have a cylinder here. You can see that if we slice this, we would get a bunch of circles. What's very surprising, though, is that there is a way you can slice this and end up with a rectangle, which seems impossible because it's round. But yet, if we hold it in just like this, suddenly a rectangle pops up. In other areas, people can see the paths different shapes take as they roll, do puzzles in the Enigma Cafe, and check out the hyper hyperboloid chair. In its initial state, all of the red and yellow strings are straight up and down. But as I rotated around, the strings went on different angles. And what you can see is I'm now inside something that's lovely and curved. But yet any one of these strings is still exactly a straight line. And you can experience fractals at something called human tree. Your arms have been replaced by another copy of you. Oh. Similar structures being repeated at smaller and smaller scales. At MoMath, you can even see how music and math are related. Each one of these spheres stands for a different three-note chord uh, that could be used in music. So, for example, this one right here is a major chord, and this one here is a minor chord. And you can hear that that one sounds a little more somber. Uh, and so what makes up a chord? What is the important aspect of it? it turns out it's the spacing between the notes. How, you know, how different the first and second notes are in pitch, and how different the second and third notes are in pitch. It makes me want to like, learn math more, um, more math that's hands-on. A lot of museums are, don't touch, because it's very valuable. It's, this stuff is valuable, but it's great, it's great that you can like, play around with it. You always have fun stuff to do here. Do you think you're learning about math? Yeah, definitely. Halloween is almost here, and New Yorkers welcome ghosts and ghouls with open arms and in imaginative ways. Tina Beth Pina gives us a tour of spooky delights, starting with Edgar Allan Poe at the Morgan Library. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary. Step into the world of the Raven and Edgar Allan Poe, here at the Morgan Library. The exhibit, Terror of the Soul, explores Poe's poetry, fiction, and literary criticism, and the influence the author had on writers. See firsthand how Edgar Allan Poe has entranced readers for more than 150 years through viewing the manuscripts and letters written in his own hands, and the artwork he inspired. What better place to get into the spirit of the holiday than at the annual Halloween extravaganza and procession of the ghouls at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. On the Friday before Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, brave souls can see the classic German expressionist horror film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, with live organ music. Then, experience the spectacle of ghostly mischief and ghoulish tricks as a cathedral is taken over by creatures of the night. Of course, there's much to do in the city for little ghosts and goblins. The High Line will be transported to a spooky past where children of all ages can dress up in their favorite costume and trick or treat their way through the park. Enjoy an afternoon of art, music, ghost trains and ghouls in one of the most beautiful outdoor spots in New York. <music> to celebrate the fall harvest season, come to the New York City Parks Pumpkin Fest in Leafy Central Park on October 26th. The fest offers a host of activities for the whole family, including the haunted house at Bethesda Fountain, Kidditch matches a la Hogwarts, the pumpkin patch arts and crafts projects, and live entertainment. And it's all for free. Finally, Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow comes to life in the historic Hudson Valley, where the story takes place. 
conveniently located just a few miles north of New York City, visit the most spectacular Halloween event in the area, now to the beginning of November. Be transfixed by the magical display of thousands of jack-o'-lanterns illuminating the landscape. Hear the dramatic retelling of the Sleepy Hollow tale by a master storyteller in the old Dutch church featured in the story. And don't miss the Horseman's Hollow Haunted Trail for a truly scary interactive experience. Visiting Washington Irving's home is also part of the fun. So there is something for every age and every scare level. For more information on these events, log on to our website at cuny.tv. For Arts in the City, I'm Tina Beth Pina. Or 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 And that's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, you can log on to cuny.tv. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City.